before and after. We ask our Father's blessings upon this study today. What this, have you seen pictures ever of a before and after thing? You know, whether it be a diet or exercise or whatever. I kind of want to apply that, and it'll also be the title to our next newsletter: Before and After. But before what? And think of this in a spiritual sense: your travel in God's time plan and through the dispensation. And don't let that sound far out to you. What does it mean before and after? Before what? Before the first overthrow by Satan, the first rebellion in the world that was? Before Adam, that's just to say the reconstitution and solidification of this present earth age? Before what? And naturally that applies to what part of God's Word you're reading and studying from. Today we're going to go into that realm that is so seldom touched, the creations of the very heavens and the earth and of the sons of God. Now, we will find that it is referred to as sons of God before this earth age, for there was not a woman. We were all the same before this earth age. And do you know something? In the eternity, so we shall be again. There shall be no giving and taking in marriage, for we shall all again be as the angels. Not my words, the words of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus. And this is written into his word to, as an indication to the deeper student to be alert. Matthew 35, 13 speaks of that time. What can we liken the kingdom of heaven unto? He had just taught the parable of the tares. That is to say, when an evil one came in the garden and planted the wicked seed, the one in the Greek, which is to say something that looks like wheat, but is not, which is to say something that looks like a child of God, but it is not, but contrary, a child of the devil. And he said, there's nothing new in this. The proof is in the 35th verse, chapter 13, verse 35. Let's pick it up with 34, rather. And all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Remember back in the 10th verse, he explained to the disciples why he taught them parables. It was not meant that everyone should have ears to hear and understand the word of God. It's just That is to say, through this particular earth age, it just is not given that all should understand the most in-depth truths, else they would be accountable for something they could not bear up to, and then their innocence would no longer be their cloak, their ignorance, rather, would no longer be their cloak of innocency. So God will only awake people to that knowledge whereby they are able, in truth, to perform the duty that he would choose them to do, that is to say, destiny. He did not speak in anything but a parable to hide the truths in part we're going to be speaking of today. 35, that it might be fulfilled. You see, there's a purpose for it. A very simple explanation. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, this would be well and good, but again, when was before? Because... The foundation of this world, in most people's mind, would be the time of Adam. However, this word in the Greek is not. To the verb there, too, is kebe, which is the overthrow. That is to say, when the earth was in its perfection, before Satan's rebellion and God destroyed the earth, rather than to destroy a third of his children that followed Satan. We're talking about a time in a total different age than we are presently in. How is it written, I chose mine elect before the foundations of this earth? How does, a, how does a pastor explain that? Most don't. They pass over it. He chose them because in the first rebellion, they stood firm and strong against Satan and earned the right to be called God's elect, not making them any better than anyone else but having already been tested by the fire that he knew in the last generation those elect would also stand against Antichrist when he walked this earth without wavering, knowing that he could bring the knowledge back to them, knowing they had a purpose, and most of you knew from the time you were a child there was more to God's word than you were being taught. 
And that you had a destiny and a purpose uh, in God's way. These things were kept secret. What was the prophet that said that anyway? We'll go there in a moment. Who was this prophet that spoke these words concerning these things kept secret? Let's go back to the step before this, verse 37 in this 13th verse concerning that planning of the tares. That is to say, when Eve uh, conceived uh, and Cain, the first murderer, was born into this world, bringing the wicked seed, which Jesus himself in St. John chapter 8, verse 40, 44, called the sons of the devil, meaning the Kenites, K-E-N-I-T in the Hebrew tongue, meaning sons of Cain. That's all you're saying. It's many times in God's word that few English readers understand the manuscripts. Not a new thing under the sun. He that soweth, verse 37, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. This, this is an explanation of the planting of the tare. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, and, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Child means seed. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Now, that's real difficult to understand, isn't it? Oh, we could spiritualize that away if we wanted to. If we wanted to be stupid, we could spiritualize it totally away. But Paul states in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, he says, I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Think of this in a spiritual sense now. We're going to take it spiritual. Not as Eve, now we go back to the literal. Not as Eve who was beguiled by the wicked one, this one. The word beguiled in the Greek is expatio, and it has one meaning only, wholly seduced. So let there be no mistake about what happened in the garden, that what started the Kenites, that's to say the sons of Cain, that are still present in the world today. Not to be hated by any means, but certainly to be noted and understood by God's elect. For where they are shall Antichrist appear. Some of you have a destiny. Turn with me to Psalms, Psalm 78. I want you to just let your minds, do not lock yourself into this and be blind in this one earth age. This earth is millions of years old. This earth age, this cosmos, is only approximately um, 6,000 years old. I'm saying the earth age, the this particular governmental age, certainly not the arets, the terra firma, this earth. The earth was created millions of years ago, and this King James declares it. It's just that man does not understand. Chapter 78 in the, in the book of Psalms, let's begin with verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. In other words, you sharpen up your ears and you listen. I will open my mouth in a parable. This is the prophet that spoke it. This was fulfilled in Jesus Christ in that Matthew 13. I will utter dark sayings of old. When? Of old. That means ancient. Showing that divine history contains more than appears on the surface to God's elect. Which we have heard and known of our fathers, our, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. We shall continue recounting these experiences generation after generation down through the remnant. That's why all were blinded in Romans chapter 11 by our Father, except the remnant. As it is written in Romans 11, even now there is a remnant that is able to see the truth. Making them something special? No. Passing along the plan of God whereby God's prophecy could come to pass exactly as it's written. Did he need the help? No. But it's part of his plan that he would have that remnant, that would have the knowledge and the leading and the understanding to fulfill his word. Again, these are the scriptures Jesus was referring to in that 13th chapter of Matthew. For he established a testimony in Jacob. That's the natural seed of the 12 tribes of Israel. Those 12 tribes of which 10 went north over the Caucasus Mountains later were called the Celts, settling Europe many years later migrating to this great nation. Where are God's children? Most people ignorantly try to cram all tribes into one, that being the tribe of Judah, 
which is a blessed tribe, but is only one of twelve. Where are the rest? God stated, My people shall become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Where are they? And yet, the reckoning by the, the accounting is that there are only 19 million of Judah today. Well, that's, there are a lot more of Judah than that. That's all that's counted. But Judah is only one tribe. Where are the rest? The story has not been recounted from generation to generation. And dullness has fallen upon the ears of the people, for they care not to dig into the word of God. A testimony in Jacob appointing, appointed a law in Israel. This is the Mosaic law, which he commanded our fathers that they should not, that they should make them known to their children. Pass them on six, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who shall arise and declare them to their children. You'll remember, you'll remember in Ezekiel chapter 28. First, let's take a recount of Psalms 104. Don't turn there. You'll remember it. We taught of it not long ago in the ministers of fire. When God said, I created the very heavens, I created the clouds, I created my angels, which are spirits. And I created my ministers of fire, which are his elect. Those fiery stones that are on the very altar. And then do you remember Ezekiel chapter 28 when Satan is king of Tyre. Tyre in the Hebrew tongue meaning rock, the false rock, not our rock. Their rock is not of our rock. As that anointed cherubim, the cherubim that protecteth, meaning covereth of the mercy seat, Satan. He said, you walked up and down to and fro on the fiery stones of the altar. Do you know who those fiery stones were? Do you not remember Revelation chapter 2 when he says, if you have ears to hear, I will give you a new stone, a white stone with a name written thereon, a minister of fire. That truth that is hidden in the word to most people but brought forth in the parables if you'll take a moment to think. And I said, well, Satan's always hitting on me. Well, don't do trouble. Stay away from it, all right? He knew you when you were one of those stones on the altar. He, he's got your number, friend. Though when God's elect pass through this flesh age, and you only do it one time, there's no such thing as reincarnation. It's an abomination to God. But it was that each soul had to pass through the womb of woman. That is why the angels that took the shortcut and rather took the woman for a play pretty fell to damnation in Genesis chapter 6. But that they would come into this earth age as a minister in these end times especially. This generation, the generation after the fig tree was planted to serve God and bring by his prophecy. So, we see Satan then knowing God's elect. When God's elect, born innocent of woman, must come to the full knowledge by studying what? God's word. Satan has most everyone else deceived. The rapture theory being a large thing in part. We're going to fly away. We don't have to worry about Antichrist because we won't be here. That's deception. And they mislead the people. But this in itself puts an automatic cloak of innocency over them, for they didn't know what they do. But one group must stand. Those stones, the stones of God, and they have a destiny. How can we take a look? Where are the scriptures that let us see how, if you would, the very foundation was? Turn with me. Next book after Psalms, Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs 8. Let's start with verse 22. You're all familiar with this eighth proverb. It is concerning wisdom. That that is one of the most precious commodities on earth, that wisdom. The reason I come to this place is where we can look into the creation a little bit. That one place that seeds of truth are expounded upon. Verse 22, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Of old what? of the old earth age. You, if you do not understand the three earth ages spoken of by Peter in Second Peter chapter 3, there is no way you can understand the overall plan of God. You, you have blinders on, and you can only see this earth age, the works of old, that is to say, the world that was. I was set up 
from everlasting, from the beginning, or ere the earth was. Now, that's before, friend. Then we could go on to before that if you wanted to. But we wouldn't get very far. For that is before. Before even the creation, wisdom was with God. Let that be an example of how important it is to have wisdom concerning God's scriptures. When there were no depths, that means there was no abyss. There wasn't even a place for Satan. You know why? They didn't need one. I was brought forth when there were no fountains abounding with water. You know why there weren't? God hadn't created them yet. He's letting you know this is before. 25. Before the mountains were settled and before the hills was, I brought forth. Does that give you a little insight into creation? You've heard of the Big Bang and a bunch of other things. Before the mountains were settled. 26. And while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. Do you know what this means in the Hebrew? Not even one little atom was formed at the time when wisdom came to dwell with God. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Do you know what that is? What turns a compass? The magnetic poles had to be there before there could be a compass. Even a compass rose, so to speak. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, and when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandments when he appointed the fountain foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. What caused God to rejoice even that long ago? Wisdom, not folly. Wisdom. Wisdom can never harm you. You must remove the blinders that have been placed on by traditions of man. By religion, and you have seen it not too long ago, we had a court uh, challenge to teach something other than evolution to the school children in this state of Arkansas. What wisdom was allowed to present itself before that court? None. Men that would stand up and hold this Bible in their hand and argue that this earth was only 6,000 years old. That is not wisdom. That is stupidity and shows ignorance as far as understanding God's word when very clearly in the manuscripts, Genesis chapter 1, God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth, period. It didn't say when. It was millions and millions of years ago. And then in verse 2 in the manuscripts, it very clearly states, to Huvapaho, the earth was not created void and without form 6,000 years ago, but 6,000 years ago it became void and without form. It was destroyed at Satan's first rebellion. Then those in the community of science would have listened, but there was no teacher <laughs> present nor allowed, though they were volunteers. They did not want to hear the truth. And I will make a statement in passing. Should it happen again in the state of Arkansas, we will be heard. For the supreme judge of this state at this time would insist upon it. Not that we as individuals, but that the truth be brought forward. Indeed, we are fortunate now in the state of Arkansas. It's too bad we were not at that time. But men, though they have moved forward in technology to the point that it is over it is awesome, overwhelming when you stop and appreciate the accomplishments of man as far as the space shuttle in itself, the greatest missile launch platform ever designed by man, whether it be for photography or whatever. Man on the moon landed, departed, took back up with a space vehicle that was able to bring them back to a safe landing on this great nation. But where are we in theology? The earth was, was formed 6,000 years ago. I'll swear to it on the Bible. Mm -mm -mm. 
we're back past the horse and buggy days as far as scholarship is concerned. Billions of dollars being spent on health and technology when the simple plan of health is here in your hand for free by using enough insight to understand it and follow the plan of God. But man in his stubborn onslaught to destroy himself will not take the time to smell the roses that God placed upon this earth for man to follow the direction, the truth, the beauty. Let's go again to Isaiah 43, if we may. Isaiah 43. This is really a simple message. It simply means open your eyes. It gives you the before and the after. Many people would say, well, are you saying that we were with God before? Well, tell me this. Where did you come from? Did, did you come out from under a rock out here in the woods? Well, of course not. I came. My spirit came from God. My soul came from God. Then what are you arguing with me about? You were with him. Well, uh, I know, but I just he just hatched me and I came directly here. How do you know that? That's not what God's word says. You were with him eons uh, before you made the trip here. Because in his creation, he created man immediately after the foundation long before the fall. And you know something? He didn't create any others after that. So if you showed up somewhere in between, my friend, you're a strange individual indeed. Now, I know this may sound far out to some, but bless your hearts. Now, listen to what I'm saying. You came from God and you will admit it. Then don't argue with me or the scriptures, please. That's all I'm saying. 43. Let's take the first verse, Isaiah. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee. Understand? Created. Not hatched. He created the soul of that one Jacob. Not the flesh, the soul. O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. I gave God name this one. And we don't have to worry how precious it is. Skip on to verse 8 for the sake of time. I would recommend that you cover the entire chapter, but for the sake of time, we will not. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf people that have ears. You know what that means? So they got eyes, but they can't see. They can't see the truth. That's what he's talking about. They're deceived. Bring those forth that do not have the wisdom. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people together be gathered rather together and let the people be assembled whom among them can de declare this and show us former things. That means from the world that was. Very few. I'll answer it. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth that I told you this from my word. That's what the Father is saying. Who, who are your witnesses? They're the prophets themselves. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen. He's talking to his chosen people. That ye may know and believe me. It's important. You can't understand God's plan if you don't understand the world it was. If you don't understand what before means. And understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Do you understand now why he calls himself Iyah, Asha, Iyah, I am that I am? He is the I am. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. I am the bread. I am the vine. I am. Before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. Eleven, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now, this cuts it down pretty fine, friend. If you've been shopping around for the best way to go, that, that spends you a, a lot of time, that'll save you a lot of time shopping. There's no other place to shop. There's no other security. Well, I'd just like to put myself a little aside, a little security in this earth age, and you should, using common sense and wisdom as best you can, but don't ever dare. Put it before your security in Almighty God. 
or you'll never have any security anywhere. And always let your security in him be foremost. Twelve, I have declared and have saved and I have showed that when there was no strange God among you. Tell me, when was this? Come on, someone tell me, when was there no strange God among us? you got to go before, a long time ago, beloved, before Satan rebelled. There was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witness, saith the Lord, that I am God. Oh, bless your hearts, remove those blinders. Don't let people make fun of God and his creation when they say, how do I know God's real? Yea, before the day, yea, before the day was, I am he. Before there was even one day, I was it. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and what, and who shall let it? Anyone want to try to turn back the work of God? It's written, and it's going to happen exactly as it's written. That's why Jesus, when he was asked by the great scholars of his day, Master, please tell us. And he would look at them head on in astonishment and say, Hey, it's written. Haven't you ever read it, Chuck? You don't have to ask me if you study the Word. That's what it implied. The disappointment that he had in those that claimed to be scholars of that day. How many times he said, it is written. 14. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in their lips. We switch here to history. But yet we also switch to prophecy in the future since which is the after. Meaning that Babylon of the end times, which is to say Satan's rule, that Babylon mentioned in the book of Revelation, God has already taken care of it for us. If uh, you are in him and he is your redeemer. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together, and they shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. That means like the wick in a lamp. Have you ever seen one? that you touch it and it just turns to char in your hand as nothing. God says, I've already taken care of it for you. Do you believe me? Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Don't you ever stop to think back the way I created things is what he's saying. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something few people ever do. And within it is your strength. Within it is your beginning. Within it is the key to David, the fulfillment of God's plan. Behold, I will do a new thing. You know what he's saying here in the Hebrew? Let me just, just, for, just trust me. You check it out later. Do you know what he's saying here? If you think it was something I did in the old, you wait till you see my new that you have a part in. That's what he's saying. If you think the way I did away with old Babylon was something, you wait and see how I'm going to use you, you that have a destiny to do away with this Babylon that's coming soon. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? Very, very few will. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness, even rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people, my chosen. Are you one of his chosen? What he said here, many people might say, well, how did we get all those animals? They're wild. No man has ever seen them. God said, yet I water them. I take care of them. Don't you think I'm going to take care of you? You're my children. If I'll take care of those dumb animals out there that no man has ever seen, don't you think I will take care of you, my chosen? Don't doubt God. Never doubt God. Oh, God, why did you pick on me today? He's getting your attention, friend. He's correcting you a little bit. He's saying, line up. But you have a destiny. And he is magnificent in bringing to pass his promises. It shall be. 
Do you believe that God has special angels? Let's go. Let's turn back one step further. Turn with me to Timothy. First Timothy. Let's go to chapter five. I only want to cover one verse. Chapter five in First Timothy, the New Testament. What about angels? Well, angels are simply those chosen. It means messenger. God uses messengers to correct and instruct men, even on this earth age today. Daniel saw an angel, and he fell down before it, and the angel said, Get up. I'm just a fellow servant, just like you are. It means a soul that has either not made an appearance through the earth or will make an appearance through the earth in the near future. An angel is only a soul, an entity. Verse 21, I want you to think back. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There we have two offices of the Godhead. And the elect angels. Oh my goodness, God has angels that are even elect. Why not? They're God's elect. It just simply means they're there at the altar instead of in the flesh here. And do you understand that they are called an office second to the office of the Godhead, not to pump anyone up, beloved, but to show you a little truth behind the veil, to see and to understand the way of God, let it rather than puff you, humble you before Almighty God, if he has his hand upon you and you have a destiny. The elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Don't be puffed up. Don't play favorites. But serve God in your election, honestly, straightforwardly. Allow God to bless your work and to take it to the ends of the earth. Oh, bless your hearts in this little old chapel. He's taken us from a meeting on a hill in the rooms of houses. And there's some of you sitting in this room right now that have sit at my table, my dinner table, when that's all the church there was in this town. And it hasn't been that many years ago. The person I see now is not an old person getting there, but... <laughs> that one in the blue with the red face right back there <laughs> it's getting redder but I'm sorry Kathy but he has taken us and allows us from this building to reach one third of the earth's surface instantly and we haven't seen anything yet don't limit God trusting his elect and know that you were before that we will be again. There is a before and there is an after. Keep the blinders off. Let's all turn back to the Romans and we're to, com to conclude. We've read it many times. I hope it has a little special meaning to you today in closing. The book of Romans chapter 8. I hope that without very little commentary that you, it just falls like music upon your ears. The truth of God's word. He was talking here to his saints, which are his elect. I'm going to pick it up in verse 27. With the thought in your mind, as I read this 27th verse, is we don't know everything that is behind that veil. You don't even know a lot of times what to pray for. So that's why sometimes you may have intended to go over there and you end up back over here if you're one of God's elect. He moves you where he wants you, for it was written long ago. And our Father is in control. This has nothing to do with those of free will. That is to say, that are, must test themselves in this earth age to love either Satan or God. This has to do with God's election. For you see, there are both free will and election. I speak to God's elect, verse 27, Romans 8. Let it fall upon the buds of your mind and pollinate the wisdom of God. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, that set apart ones in the Greek, elect, according to the will of God, not theirs, not your will, but according to God's will. Well, I didn't get my way. Well, you're probably very lucky. It might have killed you. But you're going to get it God's way. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, not free will, called election according to his purpose. 
I'll be loving. If you know that, you don't have to worry about anything. Why? Everything's going to work to your good. It will never work to your bad. For whom he did foreknow. He did what? What does that mean? Foreknow means from before. Long, long ago. And no means took you in. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be taken into that body, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What is the reward of a first fruit? It's double portion. They were first fruits because they overcame at Satan's first rebellion, God's election. I have set aside 7,000 that shall not bow a knee to Baal, Romans 11. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. He predestinated them in the earth age that was because they were the prettiest? Of course not. Because they stood against Satan at his rebellion. One third of God's children fell flat on their face. He could have killed them. But rather than killing those children, the love of our Father caused him rather to destroy the earth age that was and cause each one of those children to be born innocent of women with free will had they, if they had fallen. But those that stood were his called. Therefore, he could pre predestinate them before the foundations of this cosmos, that is to say, this earth age. Why? There's nothing unfair about it, dear one. They overcame there. Does that make them better than anyone else? Maybe a little more faithful, but not better. You don't look at it in that light. And whom he called, them he also justified. This means he judged them there. They're already judged. Does that mean you won't, one of God's elect won't get punished for something they do on earth here? Just like everybody else. You go out tonight and tie one on till your old head swells up about twice as big as it is and let me know how you suffer tomorrow morning. You don't wait till pay. A lot of people say, well, I'll pay for all my sins on Judgment Day. And the poor, ignorant dopes go around, oh, Lord, I wish I hadn't done that. What do you think he's trying to do to you? Get your attention and say, I'm going to lay the whip to you right now. He's only worried about the big things a little further down the road. And they keep doing it themselves over and over and over. And then some preacher will come along and say, God's going to get you for that when he's already getting him for it. See? And, and it'll keep on till it, he loses his family and everything. Talk about punishment and the glutton for punishment and say, wonder why God doesn't correct me. Boy, he's doing a good job of it, if you ask me. It's just you're a little dumb to see what he's doing with you. See, they were judged there, beloved. God doesn't wait 20 years down the road most times. He talks to you then. It's just that most people have a little trouble hearing him getting his attention. And whom he justified, those that he judged there, them he also glorified. What shall we say? then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, bless your hearts. It's true. Take the blinders off. That's why I want to call this little talk before and after. Do you have the wisdom to know before what? Look at our Father, His Majesty, the son that he gave were, any, were by anyone that believed upon that son, even with free will. His children that went wrong, he did not wish to kill them. But if he must at the end of the millennium, he will. But bless your hearts, let's save. Let's help him save all that we can by continuing to do his work and to teach his truth. Many might say, but you teach so deep nobody understands. Then tell me, pray, why little children 10 and 12 years old call in and ask questions all over this nation that are far more intelligent than most ministers can ask. Because the truth is simple and true wisdom that we entered with. True wisdom is not to snow people, but to take that that is difficult and simplify it, whereby anyone can understand it. That will give you a successful ministry. Why? Because I will bless it? Of course not. He will bless it. Teach in the simplicity in which Christ taught, and you'll have an audience. 
I love you all, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Let's just go to his throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you, Father, for this word. This word, which is your word, Father, and it lives for thou live. Father, be with us. Be with each and every one. As you send your elect, wherever it is you would, lead, Father, we will follow. Guide us, and we'll be careful to give you the humble praise for it. In the precious name of Jesus, we use the precious name because we believe he is. Amen, amen. In the last lecture, we studied um, before and after. And the question was, before what? Before the foundation of this earth age, the one that was? Or uh, what a question. We want to pick up on that. We discovered that before meant that before Satan's first rebellion even, even to this time. Now, there is one book that is written in God's Word that the very lead introduction shows and proves beyond any shadow of a doubt in a Hebrew idiom that this book is written to the man that lives in the flesh body that walks under the sun. Why? To help you be happy in your flesh body. To teach you how to contend with the flesh in conjunction, relationship, simultaneously with the spirit body. For we are two bodies, as Paul so eloquently taught. But Ecclesiastes addresses living in the flesh body and how to be happy while you're doing it. And it was written by that great preacher who was a king, who was Solomon, the wisest of all. Let's Get into his word. Ecclesiastes simply means to uh, to assemble, to assemble together, a convener, even if you would, or the assembler, that one that would teach in such a way that those would assemble around him. But this man of great wisdom had this pure, simple message. Wisdom is always to take that that is complicated and simplify it, whereby anyone can understand it. You know, it seems we come to the time when to be a television evangelist, you must be a great intellectual. And in some seminaries across this nation, you must become that intellectual that can speak on a level that just simply swoons away the people at Harvard. There's just one problem, beloved. We're not all that interested in the people at Harvard. We're interested in God's children, which they are a part. But understand, we're not trying to impress anyone but to take God's word and simplify it, whereby anyone can have the knowledge of God's word. So, with this truth, how are you happy in the flesh? I want you to see how it ties in with the thought of the three world ages and how you must get remove the blinders of this earth age to be happy in this flesh body. For this flesh is a very sh- is a home that you only live in a very short time compared to the time you spent with our Father. And shall again. And of course, again, we always have those, well, are you saying that we existed before this? Well, where did you come from? Well, I come from God. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we're talking about. You came from him. He created all souls at the same time. It was before the rebellion of Satan. And this earth age simply being a testing ground, I will document that before we finish this lecture today. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Verse 2. Boy, now this can really depress you if you don't stick with me and just really get vanity of vanities. That means in the Hebrew, emptiness, emptiness, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. It's all utterly vain. It is empty. There is nothing. Have you ever known someone in the flesh talk like that or feel like that? All right. Now, without the knowledge of God, that's just about what it amounts to, too. See, what profit? What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? How can man? Now, I understand. We're looking at the long haul here. How long are you going to be here? Well, I hope to live to be a hundred. That's just a little bitty short time for him. And then, what good is it going to do you for all the labor you did in the flesh? You understand? You have to place your priorities in order. I'm talking about the manual labor that you do naturally 
it accomplishes a great deal. But ask yourself the question, when you're done with the flesh body, what good is that work that you did then going to accomplish for you in the future? And again, remember, this is written to flesh man, not spiritual man. All right? It is to help you take a close look at yourself in the flesh. The point being, don't pay all that much attention to the flesh. It is the spiritual man. That's where your rewards truly are. In other words, the, the he taketh under the sun. Flesh is the only man that walks under the sun. That's the idiom. And that's where most people might as well stop reading Ecclesiastes or they do not understand the manuscripts and they miss the whole point of the entire book. Why? Bearing again your labors, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. This earth continues on and on, but as a as a chunk of meat, a flesh man, what are you and what do you amount to? Not a whole lot. For right after you, there's another generation coming right along. Understand again now, please think of flesh man. Separate yourself from the spirit, if that be possible, for just a moment. Because there's only one way you can control the flesh, and that's to separate yourself from it and take a close look at it. That's what this man of wisdom is trying to get you to do for a moment. Look at the priorities of your... Well, I go, I work down... I work over here at Rogers in a certain place making BBs. I don't know if they make BBs over at Rogers or not, but let's say they do, all right? They do, don't they? All right. We make BBs. And I make BBs. Now, I understand that there's nothing wrong with making BBs. I want to make that clear right off the bat so we don't get on anybody's toes just in case there is somebody in here that makes BBs. All right? But what good is that for eternal rewards? It sustains your family. It sustains the flesh. But as for as having eternal rewards, it does not amount to a whole lot because the day you leave there, they're going to bring in some real young BB maker to take your place. All right. There will always be BBs, in other words. All right. How did we get off on BBs? I really don't know. But anyway, there will always be somebody doing that job after you're dead and gone. All right. Verse 5. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to his place where he arose. It goes around and around and around. It comes up every morning. It goes down every night. It rushes back around China, rushes back over there, and it's ready. To, it never changes. But man dies. Flesh is perishable. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuit. Then the winter, those northerns blow down across the plains, and they bring the ice and the snow. And in the summer, that hot wind blows up from the south. In other words, the season after season, year after year, it continues on. Doesn't, doesn't this sound a little boring in a way, the way the earth is just over and over and over? What the preacher wants to do is to take the boredom out of it for you. He wants you to get the blinders off. He's about to start now, whereby you can start enjoying the beauty of God's seasons rather than looking at the emptiness that one might say, it's not going to happen. It never does. It's always the same. God's creation will always be the same, but man won't. Man won't. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto, unto the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. That old sun pops down on the ocean, causes a vapor, and up into the clouds after it runs down the river out into the ocean, right back to the land, dumped out on the hills, and down through the rivers again, over and over and over. All things are full of labor. That means weariness, a little, probably more so in the Hebrew. All things are full of weariness. Man, ish, in the Hebrew, cannot bear utter it. Can't really totally fathom it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. In other words, the labor, the inventions... The continuation to support, the labor that supports our society, no one's ever happy with it. And I'll tell you this, as we enter the end times, and as we begin to see what our labors have done to our children, our people, the poison that it brings upon God's beautiful creation, 
then we can begin to realize the true weariness that it must be to our Father as we take the beautiful creation that He provided for us and butcher it time after time after time. Nine, the thing that hath been. You got that? The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Again, emphasizing under the sun, meaning there's no new thing as far as flesh man is concerned. Now, I'm going to tell you something. 90% of your commentaries or more are going to tell you at this time, well, now, this doesn't take into consideration television, uh, high-tech computers, this sort of thing. Those things it's not talking about. Yes, it is. Those things are only new to man. They're not new to God. It is only that man cannot see the earth age that was and the high technology that was there. A pyramid, the pyramid of Giza specifically, that we with all our technology in this day and this hour cannot duplicate. So there is a technology far higher than what mere man and yet the theologians would have the nerve to say the high technology of television doesn't count. We're so far ahead of the heathen and the the, er, the cave days that they don't look past the cave days, so to speak. They don't look to that book of Ezekiel where that sophisticated, flying, highly polished bronze disc, I quote from the Hebrew, not the English, landed before Ezekiel and highly mobile, smaller vehicles came from it and moved around Ezekiel and put on a display that Ezekiel could not even relate to. Only other than wheels. All he was used to was cartwheels that rolled along beside him when he was sitting in it. And he said, if these wheels, instead of rolling along at my side, rolled this way, circular, you see, and they looked not where they went, meaning they had no heads on them. A, a, a mule, when you're riding it, if you say, giddy up, go, turn this way, his old head looks this way, and that, that lets you know he's about to execute a turn to the right. See? What Ezekiel's saying, they didn't, they looked not where they went. They, they didn't have a head on them. They just went wherever they wanted to. So you see, theologians are in the horse and buggy days compared to technology, yes. Unless the theologian cares to truly understand the Word of God and understands there is nothing new under the sun. And it, even furthermore, when you read Revelation chapter 12, you understand there was an old dragon in the earth age that was. Who was that dragon? Hey, the same one we've got today. Satan. You might say, well, I wonder just how, I wonder how we could learn a little bit more about that earth age that was. Just look at today. It's the same. The old dragon, Revelation chapter 12, drew a third of the stars. What were the stars? God's angels. Who were the angels? They're simply God's children. Are you a child of God? Of course you are. God placed a soul in you that was with him. There is no such thing as pre-existence. To pre-exist would mean you ceased existing. And even Satan himself, the only entity that has been condemned to die, still lives. So the word pre-existence is false. But we must use it to reach the mind of the man that walks under the sun. There is a time coming when you can accurately say those people pre-existed. you know why? You will be after that 20th chapter of Revelation when Satan, God is going to destroy Satan's soul. It's promised. It's recorded. It promises others will join him. But the choice is to the people in the testing ground of the man or the woman that walks under the sun, meaning in these flesh bodies. These flesh bodies that you were provided when Satan drug a third of those angels, God, rather than killing a third of his children, destroyed the earth age that was and created this beautiful earth age and created man to walk in that, to decide whether he or she would love God or Satan. 
with the millennium thrown in. So, my friend, what I'm telling you is there is nothing new under the sun. In all the wisdom that you can muster, understand that. And what you are seeing today was yesterday, meaning it happened exactly the same way in the world that was. God cannot make it any simpler through this great preacher, Solomon, who had the wisdom of wisdom, the understanding of understanding. If you wonder what it was like in the world it was, look around you. It's the same. Though the bodies, the vehicle, which is to say that flesh you live in is different, you're still the same soul. You're still the same person. God said, Esau, I hated. Why, he was a little baby in his mother's womb. He said, I hated that thing. That's your father talking, Almighty God, that is a God of love. He says, I love Jacob. I love that one. Do you think it was the chunk of meat? Now, I'm speaking a little bit perhaps graphic, but I want you to see what we're talking about. He wasn't talking about that little flesh person. He was talking about the true person that was dwelling within that flesh, which is to say Esau, who was from the world that was, that soul that had deliberately, by choice, stood with Satan and caused God's wrath. How can I say that? Because God's fair. God doesn't hate somebody for nothing. He earned it. Jacob also earned the reward. So always understand, God is fair. There is nothing new under the sun. Verse 10. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. Do you understand that? Do you realize how few people do, beloved? Thank God for wisdom. It was in the world that was. That's what he's saying. That's what I'm saying. It happened before. There's nothing new. It's a replay, and yet man is so stupid in his quest for knowledge and wisdom and time that all he has to do is look at what was to know what shall be through God's prophecies and otherwise. There is no remembrance of former things. That means when you are born innocent in that flesh under the sun, all those events are taken from your mind and you are born an innocent babe so that you have a fresh, clean start. Yes, even Esau was granted that. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Man just doesn't take the time. But you can learn through wisdom. God's Word. It's there for the taking. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under the heaven. That means on this flesh age and this flesh body. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. Giving you a little bit of knowledge so you could take your mind and exercise it just a little bit, a little exercise, if you might, into wisdom. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. It's emptiness. You know why? It's the same as before. But understand this. The preacher is telling you there are better things. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed um, with mine own heart, saying, heart translates mind in the Hebrew, okay? Lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. I'm the wisest man ever. Solomon was. My heart, my mind, that is, had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my mind to no wisdom and to know madness and folly, I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. The madness and the folly of this earth age are a vexation to the spirit man. For in much wisdom is much grief, and in he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Skip with me to chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. In other words, there is a season and a time for everything that your Father has proposed. It shall come to pass as it is written, whether it be the fall, the winter, or the spring. Whether you are to be here or somewhere else or what you'll be doing in between, it is written. If you are one of God's elect, 
if you are one with free will, you will float your merry way and make your own choice. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. The field is the world. The sower was the, was the devil and our father. The seeds of the children are here. The parable of the planter, the sower of Matthew 13. How many people know that there is an evil seed in the world as well as a precious? Very few. Yet it is written in God's Word so plainly. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And even as Jesus said when he walked the earth, John the Baptist came and they called him what? They called John the Baptist a... um, a, a, a glutton, wasn't he? And they called Christ a wine bibber. When John came, they wanted to play funeral. And when he came, they wanted, or rather, when John came, they played fun- funeral. And when he came, they played wedding. I think I've got them just backwards. There's a time and a season for everything, and you should have them straight. All right. Now, verse five: <laughs> a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace. A time. To refrain from embracing. Beloved, do not let your emotions be upset if it isn't the time you want. Okay? Be patient. Well, I feel like embracing today. If it isn't the day. By that I mean if someone is trying to take advantage of your Christian heritage, honey, that's not the time to embrace. In other words, if Satan is trying to compromise your beliefs through love, for he has spiritual love as well. It's just that it's of the wrong channel. All right. So if you are sad, there's a time for it. Is what God's saying. I'm going to take you through those places. Prepare yourself mentally for it. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. In other words, to tear and then put it back together. Make it a little stronger each time. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. The discerning of spirits, beloved, falls in that category. A time to love and a time to hate, a time to war and a time of peace. In God's plan, all these things shall be. What is the final peace? Peace, 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 they will cry. You hear it now. But there shall be no peace until the true Prince of Peace return. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? What profit again is this old earth to you? I have seen the travail, that's the businesses, which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it, to keep them busy. I see what God has caused man to have to do to sustain himself and his family. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. God created all things beautiful, and so they are until man pollutes. Also, he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end, before and after. Before what? Before the beginning. Which beginning? The beginning of the world age that was, beloved. Always remember the opposite lecture on this tape. Always go back to Proverbs chapter 8 when you have lose face of when wisdom actually came to dwell with man as this preacher of wisdom, Solomon, is teaching you now. Whereby you can better understand that world that was. Man just can't dig it out on his own if he looks only at the labors of the flesh. You must go deeper into the spiritual to know and understand the world age that was and the world that shall be and to earn your rewards and your place in that world age beautiful that is coming that our sister sang of earlier. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man, or you might say better translated, except to a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. Do you understand that? It may seem empty, but what he's saying, enjoy it while you're going through it. Make the best of it. You can. You can enjoy it, but don't expect more out of it than it can give. It cannot give you eternal life. God did not create this earth age to give you eternal life. God did not create this flesh body to give you eternal life, for this flesh body is sin. But it is an abode for your spiritual body. So enjoy the flesh body, the beauty in which God created it and the earth. 
and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Do you understand that? Never be depressed and say, well, it's all empty, it's all for nothing. It's the sun comes up every morning and goes down every night and I find this whole mess so boring I could just cry. Okay? Be happy. You're not going to have all that many sunrises or sunsets. You're only in the flesh a short time, so make the best of it. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. You understand that? God gave this to you for a pleasure, and whatever he does, it's forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. In other words, God's creation is going to be the way it's written. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Better translated, shall reverence before him, shall love him. That's all he wants, is your love. That which hath been is now. I want to read these real slow. It's why I came here. That which hath been is now. And that which is to be hath already been, beloved. And God requireth that which is past. Oh, bless your hearts. Haven't you ever thought to yourself at some moment, some day, when events happen, I've been here before. I've witnessed this before. Don't you see the beautiful hand of God? Do you see the truth of this message? He's saying, don't be confused about what tomorrow shall bring. Don't be confused as to how it was in that earth age past, for it's the same as today. Using wisdom, of course, to keep your season straight. Understand of what I speak. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. That's the final. And wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that inequity was there. I said in mine heart, this is in my mind, this man of wisdom, God, shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time and there for every purpose and for every work. Every work, even in the flesh, has its proper place and its proper time. Your spiritual rewards are the greater, for they are eternal. They shall be forever. I said in my mind and my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men. This is to say those flesh people that had God's beautiful spiritual souls dwelling within them, that God might manifest. You understand? Translate that test. Just scratch through manifest and write test there, okay, so that you better understand it. That God might test them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Now, beloved, that would really throw you if you hadn't been following me. There is the flesh of man and there is the flesh of animals. The difference in flesh with the metabolism circulating through it between animal and man is little difference as far as the flesh is concerned, but the higher intellect and the soul of man naturally with the spirit dwelling therein is a far higher body. But this is why if you were to read on to the ninth chapter of this book, he would go a little further and he would tell you very bluntly that a live dog is better than a dead lion. You know why? When meat's dead, it's dead. Now, again, I, I want to make my point, and that's why I'm speaking uh, so graphically. Because it's not you. That's what I'm saying. It's not you. It's simply something you borrow to make it through this time of testing. And it is seen. It shall go back to the dust and the ashes to ashes, but your beautiful spiritual soul that the Father gave you shall return immediately to the Father. That is why it is said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever. Did it say the good people, the bad people, the blacks, the whites, the orientals? No, it said whosoever shall believe upon him shall have eternal life, should not perish, rather, but have eternal life. That means you're not going out here in a hole in the ground, my dear one. It means you're going, that's his promise, you're going instantly to the Father for eternal as it is used. I know it says everlasting in the English. The word eternal as it is in the Greek manuscripts even means more than from that day onward. It means from the time your soul was created, not ceasing even into the eon. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beast, even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Both the man and the dog, 
even they have all one breath. It's that breath of life that they inhale, oxygen, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast for all is vanity. As far as the flesh is concerned, it is vanity. It's going back to dust. Understand? Now, you see how depressing this would be for some people to teach if they didn't understand the separation of body and soul? That you have a spiritual body? That you That is really you? That is really your home? And, and go into one place, all are of the dust. In other words, both the beast and the man, they go to the same place. That's the dust. What are we talking about? The man that walks under the sun. What is the man that walks under the sun? Your flesh body, not your spiritual body. And all turn to dust again, both man and beast. Now, what he wants you to do is to see how much importance you should put on the flesh body. Are you getting it? I mean, take good care of it. Don't misunderstand what he's saying. Because you're stuck with it for at least the time you're here. All right? So take pretty good care of it. Um, 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? I hope you do after we taught this. For it's the spiritual body. And the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Do you understand? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. For that is his portion. That's your lot. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Our Father in the Spirit only for the flesh shall return to dust and even become a part of the land, the earth age, that the others shall walk upon. We'll be through with it. It will be done. Well, then that sounds... Uh, I just must do one thing. So for the benefit, so that no one is confused by this, I wasn't going to do this. Turn to chapter 12 with me. Chapter 12 in this Ecclesiastes 10. Chapter 12, that is. Verse 6. For ever the silver cord be loosed and the golden bowl be broken or the pitcher be broken at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's flesh, dear one. And the Spirit shall return unto God whom gave it. Who gave it to you? Who gave you that spiritual body? Almighty God. And the separation of flesh and soul shall be at that moment. Let's go back to when man was created. Let's take a little closer look at it. We're going to rush right along. And I may come a little fast. I'll give you a question and answer session. But I've got to wind this up, I think, in ten minutes for the tape audience. I want you to t- turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. I will read it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. The Lord God formed Adam from the clay and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Well, now, most people teach that, that presto, Adam did not exist until that time, and I tell you, that's not what it says. Now, listen to me and make notes if you like. When God did what? He breathed. What is that word in the Hebrew? That word in the Hebrew is not And it means to inflate. Right inflate where it says God breathed. God inflated this man with the breath. What is the breath? The breath in the Hebrew is neshama. And neshama means a divine. It means divine inspiration. God breathed, inflated this flesh, this clay, with divine inspiration, a soul, a spiritual spirit, or it also means intellect. Nish Amah. God placed a, an intellectual soul within that clay and gave it life. What is life? Life is K. In the Hebrew, both animals and men have it. All it means is it means it's alive, raw flesh. In the Hebrew, it means raw flesh. That's for those that would understand, medically speaking, metabolism. Working, functioning metabolism. And it became a living soul. You know what? He already was. It was the clay that became the living soul. For the soul was placed in it. That's all it's saying in the Hebrew. The Soul, of course, is nephesh in the Hebrew, and nephesh simply means one singular self, own, your own, in other words, 
your entity, your soul is actually you, not this flesh. All right? You're not going to have this flesh always. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Let's keep it as long as we can, but then when we get ready to get rid of it, well, we have a far better body waiting. So God inserted, not from scratch, He inserted a soul that already had the ability of spiritual uh, inspiration. And it was for this reason that he could say in Jeremiah chapter 1 to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Because God places every soul in the body. When does he place it in the body? At conception. Okay, in closing, real quick, turn with me to Isaiah 43. We covered this last week. I want to do it again in closing. Isaiah 43. I've just got two or three more little scriptures I want to get in here. Okay, we have seven minutes. Isaiah 43, verse 18, and I'm going to begin reading. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. This means the ancient things, beloved, in the world that was. Can you remember them? That's what God is asking. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? How many of you are going to understand it's what he's saying? I will even make a way in the wilderness and the rivers and the desert. Verse 20, Isaiah 43. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons, the owls, because I gave give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to bring drink to my people, my chosen. In other words, I take care of my own. And 21. And this people have I formed. Formed. Do you know what that means? Created. Formed. For what? For myself. God loves you. He created these people for himself, for this area of testing. They shall show forth my praise. There is a day coming. Turn quickly on to Isaiah 45 in conclusion. I want to read. We'll start reading at verse 17 and think on the things that we have said. I'm going to make very little comment. Just think and draw on the things we have said. 4517. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. You're going to understand what's happening. You're not going to be confused. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it he created it not in vain. This is tuhu vabuhu in the Hebrew, which means it was not created void and empty, but that it became void and empty after Satan's rebellion. He formed it to be inhabited, not to be void. He had men here on this earth. Yes, this earth before it was destroyed at Satan's rebellion. This earth being millions of years old according to God's word. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is just no other God besides me. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. Why is it you people don't understand me is what he's saying. I haven't hidden this from you. It's here in the word all the time. Why can't you understand it? I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain for emptiness. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. I am a fair God. Assemble yourselves and come and draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations and that have they that have no knowledge that set up the wood in their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save, a God that did not create. And I tell you this, there are many churches in this nation to the day that are just as bad off as they that carve the image, for they teach a rapture out before the true Messiah returns to this earth, and there shall not be, and they shall worship that false God because of deception, till ye tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Underline that ancient time. Now, I know it's late, and I don't want you to be tired, and I want you to be sharp, and I want you to be wise. Ancient time means it was declared even in the world it was. There's nothing new under the sun. But ancient time, who hath told it from that time? God didn't hide it. It's written here in his word from word, the, the word go. Have not I the Lord? 
And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Look unto me, and be ye saved at the, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Whether it be the end of the first earth age, this earth age, or the one that is coming, I am still the only God, and there is no other way to salvation except through me. I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Do you know when that takes place, beloved? There's only one time, in, not in history, but there is only one time when that shall come to pass, and we can call it history, for it happened once before, and it shall again. I speak of the world age that was at the first rebellion at Satan's great trial. Every knee bowed. But then as each is placed innocent with all the former things taken from the mind of that innocent babe, whereby it grows up and attains and has as much wisdom concerning God's word, which every sentence was declared long ago of ancient time, how much have you absorbed? It's not a hidden thing. It is very obvious. And God holds his elect accountable. Every knee shall bow on that first day of the millennium. It's coming. God has a destiny for you to stand up uh, for your people, to see that the world is warned of the first uh, tribulation, that tribulation of Antichrist, as it is written, is coming. Have you warned the people? He has, get, give, he has given us a great tool to do this with. Oh, I thank our Father for his word. I thank him for the wisdom of Solomon, our teacher, our preacher in this day's service. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let us go to his throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the word, the written word. Lord, let it absorb in our minds and our understanding, in our hearts, Father, to motivate us, to exercise us in that business that you would have us to do, thy work. In these end times, in his precious name we pray, amen.